Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, February 1st, 2019. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and I am here to put science in your brains. Today is one of those news days where uh, everything's coming up, well, sciencey. Um, and it's the kind of science that, well, in the first case, any one of you, and some of you may have participated in. In particular, what I'm hinting at is we had a lunar eclipse last weekend. And during that lunar eclipse, observers all around the world, or at least on the half of the world that was able to see the eclipse, reported seeing a bright flash in what was generally seen as either the lower left hand or upper right hand corner of the moon, depending on which hemisphere you're on. Um, when they uh, observed this, luckily there were people live streaming the event, there were people photographing the event, there were digital records of what was happening. So we had observer after observer turning in various images all showing this, well, little tiny flash in the night. Now we've long known that for various reasons, our moon will periodically have these bright flashes. It has long been um, well argued over on just what these might be. There are those who argued for a while, uh, here I'm looking at work done by Arlo Krauts, that these might be outgassing events. There are observers who are saying these are impact events. Today, the most common justification we give or explanation we give for why these bright flashes occur is that this is in fact the impact of small objects onto the surface of the moon and that flash that we're seeing is the energy of the impact being dissipated in the form of light. Now the object that crashed into the moon here was probably about 30 to 50 centimeters in size. Um, so, so for those of you who speak English, it was at most half a yard in size, so one and a half feet. Um, and in addition, it was probably 20 to 100 kilograms, so the weight of an average man at most um, in mass. It would have crashed into the moon at about 47,000 kilometers per hour. So that's a lot. And we caught it as a shared event shared around the world and observed over and over. And that's what makes this particular event so very special. There've been a few cases of people who happen to be both observing the um, moons of Jupiter at the same time and caught something impacting into Jupiter. There have been um, cases of other serendipitous observations, particularly of supernova, where you get the two different names allocated uh, for the naming of the supernova. But when it comes to observing these bright flashes on the moon, not a lot of people are simultaneously looking at the dark parts of the moon, the crescent moon, and then looking at that dark place for these bright events to occur. In fact, it, it is estimated that it might have been sometime back in the 12th century 12th century, when a group of English monks happened to be out observing and they uh, reported what they described as fire and hot flashes and sparks being observed on the surface of the moon. So from the 12th century to, to today, it's been a long time since the moon gave us the shared experience of watching it get attacked. Now, what I personally am waiting for is data to come to us from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that allows us to find that impact that is new and wasn't there, well, two weeks ago. So here we go, all of us waiting for people to pour through the data, for the right images to come in, and for this object's, well, impact location to be precisely located on the moon. Now you can read more about this on archive and I will share the link in the chat. Oh, I'm going to first blight your image. Um, so let me um, share with you the press release that has links out to all the cool things and you can follow along 
on this particular discovery. And I will come back and answer all of your questions at the end of this broadcast. Now, in addition to this cool news coming to us from the moon, we also have awesome news coming to us from Mars. And this is a case of Martian uh, researchers replicating research that was done back in 1972 on the moon. Back in 1972, Apollo 17 astronauts went and drove that little moon buggy up over a hill on the moon. And as they went, they stopped roughly 25 different times. And every time they stopped that buggy, they made gravitational measurements. And what they were doing was they were measuring how the pull of gravity on the moon varied from one place to another, knowing that those variations were mostly caused by the combined factor of they were moving further from the center of the moon, but they had more stuff because of that mountain between them and the center. By measuring how the earth is pulling on you, knowing where you are located, you can actually measure the density of the material in the soils beneath you. Now, since they knew what the density was at, well, the moon equivalent of sea level, that average level from the center, they were able to then figure out what was the density of material within that mountain. Now, it was recently realized that with the Curiosity rover, which has slowly been climbing up the foothills and outer edges of Mount Scarp on Mars there in Great Gale Crater, well, it doesn't have a device that was specifically labeled on it gravenometer like the, the moon rover had. What it has instead is accelerometers and gyroscopes that are in place to allow them to navigate this little rover. And it turns out these accelerometers, these gyroscopes can be repurposed to, well, act like a gravity detection instrument. And every time that rover stops, they are able to measure out, well, the gravity on Mars. And what they found as they climbed this mountain is they were able to measure the density of the material making, making up Mount Sharp. And it turns out Mount Sharp, this splash of material in the center of Gale Crater, it's made of materials that are significantly less dense than what they had anticipated. So in research that caused modern day astronomers to look back all the way, and what I mean is this year's astronomers, to look back all the way back to October 2012 data, compile everything in a new way that had previously not been envisioned, they were able to measure a mountain. Now, what's cool about this is the data they used was just engineering data. This is stuff that literally was taken just to make sure that the spacecraft was driven correctly. So we never know where the best science is going to come from or where the next science is going to come from. And this is part of why it's so important that no data ever gets thrown out because we don't know all the different ways that creative human beings are going to find to turn, well, in this case, driving data into a gravitational measurement that leads to measuring the weight of a mountain. So this is kind of cool. And that's basically all the news I've got. As I said before, currently it's slow out there. I think everyone here in the United States is still holding our breath, waiting to see, will everything finish sorting itself out? Are we going to have another government shutdown? And we just don't know. And this makes it hard for everyone to, well, get things done. And right now we are suffering from the fact that the National Science Foundation and NASA have both put their grant deadlines on hold. And this means that someday in the future, we may be looking at a um, funding gap for scientist after scientist. And this knowledge just makes it kind of hard to get things done. So this is where we're at. The science we do have, it's kind of cool. And here's to looking forward to the day when everything is a little bit more relaxed and it's a little bit more easy 
to just focus on discovering and exploring our universe. So I'm going to go ahead and take your questions now. And if you can type them into the chat and at me while you're at it, it will make it a lot easier for me to find them. While you're typing those in, I'm just going to go ahead and remind you, this is a production of CosmoQuest.org. We are your place to learn and do science. We are created out of the Planetary Science Institute, where I am visiting a very boring room at the moment as I work with very interesting people. And um, we are doing this in collaboration with Youngstown State University. I will be back home on Monday bringing you this from a normal location and uh, hopefully we'll have a more normal amount of science. We are sustained by you. Every subscription really matters and every bit helps us feed Annie. So thank you and um, yeah. And I, I'm going to be back here in April and Hanny, I see what you're saying and I will work on bringing some planets back so that these places look a little bit better. Okay, so scrolling back through the chat to see what questions are there. Um, uh, okay, scrolling. Hanny asks, how likely is it that two or even one meteor would hit the moon during the time it would take for the lunar eclipse? Um, I don't know the exact math, but this was suitably rare. Um, it, it was not anticipated that these things happen on a sufficient frequency that someone looking through binoculars or using their naked eye would have been able to see this kind of event, dur the impact event during something as brief as a lunar eclipse. So it was that moment of awesome. Now the thing is with a lot of these statistics, the statistics are based on what we think is true and not based on rigorous numerical analysis and observation after observation. So based on our limited knowledge, we project out how frequent we think things occur and then get surprised. But the reason I'm reminding you of that is back in 1993, when Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit Jupiter, we thought it was a once in 500 years kind of event. And that was because we just hadn't been watching Jupiter constantly enough. Now that we have consumer grade CCD cameras, uh, we have people out in their backyards with, with SLRs mounted onto their telescopes, all of these digital cameras out looking at Jupiter night after night is allowing us to over and over find evidence of Jupiter getting hit by stuff. So we now know that it's probably more like a every few years, maybe even once a year kind of an event. And we know this because we have more data, so we have better statistics. Anyways, scrolling through to look at what other questions you have. Um, so, so Hanny also asks, could Mount Sharp basically be a rubble pile? So we know what it is. When, when Gale Crater was formed, the dynamics of how craters form causes a shock wave to radiate out that forms the outer crater rim. And then there's a splash in the center. And Mount Sharp is that splash. It just turns out that the materials that make up that splash, now that we're measuring them for the first time, we now are learning they're less dense than we had thought. Um, and this is just cool. It's a first measurement and it tells us that, huh, that's cool. It makes sense. And we just didn't know it yesterday. Um, so Veronica Cure is asking, is the lunar reconnaissance close enough to view the new crater? Um, it should be. So we can measure features as small as a couple of meters across on the surface of the moon. The issue is, is LRO in an orbit that will take it over the site anytime soon? Um, so that I don't know. Um, I need to ask the people who do. Um, so I think we're just waiting for LRO to get into the right place to send us the image we want. Um, so Fenrig is saying, I hope this is not out of line, um, but you like my outfit. I like, yes, this is actually my Star Wars-y outfit. Um, I love this particular shirt. 
It is from a designer on Etsy that um, does bespoke clothing at a price a human being like me can afford that is still like not an insult to the people making the clothes. And um, yeah, I like my shirt too. Thank you. Um, okay, so Larry is saying, which mapper project will be first at the CosmoQuest site? We're probably going to bring back moon mappers first. Thank you, Bad Panda, for the subscription. Um, we're going to bring back moon mappers first just because it's the easiest. And then we'll be bringing back all the rest. And light up that chat to thank Bad Panda for his subscription. Um, okay, so, so Hany is asking, could any of Chang Yi's instruments feel the impact. I don't think so. I don't think any of them were sensitive enough. Um, so Fenry is asking, considering greater urbanization and change in types of artificial lights, how will that affect the ability of new and old amateur astronomers from seeing space objects? Oof. So this is one of those things that's, that's really hard to answer because of how lighting is changing. A few years ago, I would have given you a much more optimistic answer because we are systematically changing city lights to be compact sodium. And compact sodium lights give off a very distinct, weird orangey color. It makes everyone look sick, but it doesn't use a lot of electricity and it isn't as bad, it isn't as harmful for your night vision. Now, with the advent of cheap LED lighting, which is much bluer um, and scatters off asphalt and cement and everything else much more easily. We're going from being able to throw a filter on your telescope to filter out all of that sodium night light, um, which just leaves you with like the overly lit gas stations and things like that, those white lights, um, to now we're trying to figure out how to deal with a much brighter city that is illuminated with these white, blue-white LEDs. Now at the same time, we also are seeing in some parts of the world a movement of people to move into cities, which makes the cities bigger and worse, but empties out the countryside. And in other places, we're having systematically more urban sprawl. Urban sprawl is a bad thing. I, I am a fan of people moving into cities that get bigger and bigger and then visiting the countryside. I am a bigger fan of just like less people. Um, so less people, go less people. And countries like the United States, many European countries, we're starting to see that generation after generation, people are choosing to have only one child or zero children. And as people don't replace themselves, that will also lower the population, which means less people who need lights. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know. But these are the factors. I can tell you the variables. I just don't know what's going to happen with the variables. Um, so Astro B. London is saying, when is the next report from New Horizons? Sometime in February when they get the next image in. Um, yeah, so it's not quite Princess Leia's dress. It's just, it's, it's, it's a shirt reminiscent of what she and Amidala uh, wore. Um, and it's super comfortable. Um. <laughs> it's okay, Zuzink. Um, you guys are fabulous. Um, uh, no, none of the Apollo seismometers are still working. They pretty much stopped working back in the 70s. Um, yeah, everyone needs to visit the countryside every once in a while and see dark skies. I'm really a fan of everyone taking the time now and then to go camping someplace that doesn't allow um, one of those places where everything you carry in, you have to carry out. Um, and hammocks, hammock tents, if you don't have a whole family, hammock tents are the way to go. Anyways, anyways. Um, if you want to go dark places, I'm actually going to be hosting a tour of the Southwest next um, August, astrotours.co slash starstrider. And you can go see dark skies with me um, and Las Vegas and some national observatories. And um, this is kind of my favorite place in the world.
So I hope to see some of you there and we can share a dark sky together. And Joshua Tree. Yes, that's true. We're going to have Joshua Tree coming up in June. Um, yeah. Hammock tents are amazing. I love hammock tents. I actually now own three of them because I kept like upgrading my hammock tents. Um, anyways, that's it for today. I don't have anything else unless you have any more questions. Thank you, you Aaron. That's what that is. Thank you, Aaron73 for the sub. Light up the chat. Um, and Thank you, Trekker Kev, for the bits. And can we get a shout out for Bill Nash? He's another one of the educational streamers here on Twitch. Um, he does image reduction uh, most, e not most evenings, often in the evening. Um, and it's just pretty. If you just need a stream that is pretty, um, thank you, Veronica Cure, for the bits. Um, Oh man, I'm going to have to go back and watch that VOD. Um, that's awesome, Bill. I need to figure out if you can watch Twitch VODs after the fact by like preloading them the way you can preload a YouTube video so that I can watch it on the airplane. Um, I did hear that, so, so Noel, they actually think that Joshua Tree probably won't be able to fully recover. Um, so one of the problems is there were assholes that during the government shutdown, it was decided because of the bad publicity during the last government shutdown, that rather than closing the doors to the United States national parks and preventing people from going in when there wouldn't be supervision, that they would just leave all the gates open and people could go in and use the national parks. And the problem is people do shit if you don't watch them. And people who wanted to go four-wheeling through Joshua Tree went in and they cut down trees to make it easier for them to go four-wheeling. And in a few places, they just cut down trees because they could. The trees at Joshua Tree, it's unknown exactly how old they are because this kind of tree doesn't have tree rings. It's imagined that some of them are a thousand years old. And Joshua Trees are very hard to grow. Thank you for the bits and ring. Thank you. Um, so, so Joshua trees are extremely hard to grow. They um, don't necessarily flower consistently. Their flowers don't all produce seeds. And those seeds don't always fall to the ground in conditions that, because it's a desert, are conducive to them actually like starting new trees. And it's, it's also a relationship with the bugs in the area. It's a very specific kind of pollinator that they have. And what they're finding is that as, as, a, as a result of climate change, the pollinators aren't always there. The temperatures are less and less conducive. And it's thought that where Joshua tree is, new Joshua trees aren't going to be able to grow. So... That park may never recover. Humans. Humans. <sighs> yeah, Larry, I agree. It's a crime. But we have bits, and we have subs, and we have good things. And we have good people here. So let's all get together in Joshua Tree and celebrate what trees are still there while we can. And the world will be good. At least our small, cor our small corner of it. Now I'm going to go out and I'm going to find ways to make more science. And I will be back online on the Astronomy Cast YouTube channel at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. That is 8 p.m. London time to bring you the science behind polar vortices. Uh, if you froze all week, well, this is your chance to find out why. So I am going to roll the credits. I am going to look for somebody that I can raid. And I am going to see all of you over on the other side. Um, this is apparently going to take me a moment because I've made a complete mess of my desktop. There we go. I found my desktop. 
Um, and I'm going to be so glad to be home on a computer that has a, a bigger screen than my laptop. So as I said, I will see you all on Monday. And uh, I will see some of you, hopefully all of you, over on the Astronomy Cast YouTube channel. Thank you for the additional bits. Um, I will see you all in a little bit over on the Astronomy Cast YouTube channel where we will discuss the science of polar vortices. And um, I'm going to roll the credits and find someone to raid. So if you want to learn more, you don't necessarily need to disappear. The science will keep on coming. So wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. And if it's warm enough, get outside and look up. Bye-bye.